afternoon, Village. It is once again great to see each and every uh, one here this morning. It is truly, truly, truly uh, a blessing. And I just must say offhand, I have never been caught in rain and just had my hair flop the way it did. <laughs> so I was a little worried how I was going to show up before y'all this morning. So it was great to see each and every one of you all. And it was a great time with you all yesterday. Um, I will go ahead and open up with our scripture, which comes from Titus chapter three. Um, our deacon read um, from the NIV and he read um, five and six. I'm going to read us four through eight from the New Living Translation. Again, Titus chapter three, and I'm going to read verses four through eight, if everyone can just nod um, when you're with me. Amen, I think I see the nods, thank you. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us the confidence that we will inherit eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good and beneficial for everyone. Church, let's bow our heads. God, I just want to thank you for just how you've already shown yourself, not only in this worship service today, but also in our gathering yesterday. God, I just wanna thank you for um, everyone that is here today. God, I wanna thank you for using me in such a mighty way to deliver your word. God, I ask that you remove me, dear God. Lord, I ask that my nerves uh, come away from this, God. And Lord, I ask that this word goes out to minister to the ears of your people, dear God, but not only that it goes in, dear God, but it also comes out and flows into another person who needs you at this time in their lives. God, I ask for um, your power to come over me right now, Lord, in this very moment. All these things I ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. So what I've noticed since I have been uh, preaching since 2016 is that when I'm about to preach in my preparation, the preparation is not only to prepare the word for you all, but the Lord allows me to experience this word that I'm about to preach in a personal way before it comes out of me. And so they're always in these times where I'm reminded that God is in control. And no matter how crazy and convoluted life gets, we all just need to submit to his plan and his perfect will. So I'll give you guys an example in this. You guys heard me in May, you heard it out of my very own mouth and Sister April records, so it would be on a recorded sermon. I told you all I was not taking any summer courses. I told you all I was going to relax. But one day at work, I was led to lurk, look at the summer course offerings at my seminary program. And I was going down the list and I saw a title of a course that shifted my focus and I was inspired to go take that course. Even though I had said, I'm not taking any summer courses. I'm going to relax. But that inspiration led me to sign up for this course. So church, I have to sit here before you and be transparent. Instead of coming home from work and spending my weekends watching reruns and marathons of Criminal Minds, Law and Order SVU, and House Hunters, 
I am sitting around completing exegetical worksheets on the pastoral epistles. Here I am. So as we look at the scripture for this month, I realized I have third Sunday and I am preaching Titus, which is one of the pastoral epistles. So I realized how the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, just how this thing works. We may say a whole lot out of our mouths, but this Holy Spirit will move us and it will shift our focus and our plans and it will cause us to submit to the plans and the will of God. But in the end church, we'll realize that when we submit, that in this process, God is equipping us and filling us with the very thing we need to accomplish his will and to bring him glory. So I come before you today saying, I didn't know back in May a whole lot about Titus, but God has equipped me today that I can preach the book of Titus. So as we move into our scriptural reference to today, I can tell you that Titus is one of the pastoral epistles. Titus is a book that's written by Paul to one of his co-laborers or younger pastors in the ministry by the name of Titus. And Titus had traveled with Paul. He had traveled with Paul in other places. You'll see his name in Galatians. You'll see his name in Corinthians. But here, he had traveled with Paul to the island of Crete. And Paul had to leave him behind. And as you see in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, Paul says in his letter that he left him behind to put what remained um, to be done in order and to appoint elders um, in every town. So Titus was placed over these churches that were lacking order and maybe a little young in their, in their growth. And so he also had to confront during this time false teachers and um, false doctrine that was going on. Let's just call it the fake news of his day that was spreading throughout Crete. And so Paul writes this letters to advise Titus and to encourage Titus in this work. And it looked like this encouragement was definitely needed because if we see in verse 12 of chapter one, the people of Crete didn't, uh, didn't have the best of reputations. Paul quotes a prophet, one of their very own, when he states that the Cretans are always liars, vicious brutes, and lazy gluttons. I read that and said, boy, Titus had his work cut out for him. But see, as we pick up at verse three, not only was Titus dealing with all of that, but Paul was also encouraging him to talk to the people about living a life that is reflective of God, live a life that is pleasing to God. And so chapter three, verse one and two opens up and it states, to remind them, to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient and to be ready for every good work, to speak of no one, I'm sorry, to speak evil of no one and to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show every courtesy to everyone. And so Paul even takes it one step further and tells them, why they should do such a thing, why they should be motivated to and inspired to do such a thing. Paul goes in and says, because we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, despicable, and hating one another. But here's the good news, church. But when the goodness 
and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. He saved us, not because of any work of righteousness we had done, but it was according to his mercy. And through the water of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Paul was saying in this section that our inspiration, the thing that should motivate us to aspire to all that's written in chapter three, verse one and two, why should we should aspire to live a life that's pleasing to God is because we are the recipients of God's grace. It is grace that should cause us to do any and all things that God calls us to do because it is his grace that has saved us and lifted us up out of this dark place where we could be suffering eternal death. It is because of that, that now we should go out and be able to do all that God has called us to do. It is this grace that keeps us from, again, eternal suffering and the separation caused by sin. We have been delivered and transformed by the work of Jesus Christ. And he, in obedience to God, he came with the message of the mess as the message of the good news and when we receive him through faith we are able to be brought back to god and titus 3 6 says his spirit was poured out richly through jesus christ our savior is that having been justified by grace we become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It reminds us that we are here today not because of anything we have done. We are here today not because we just showed up on the right day and did the right work. We are here today solely because of God's love and kindness to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. We sit here today because although we were despicable and hating one another and we were um, envious and sinners, he still saw fit to snatch us out of that place and bring us back to him, church grace. And so Paul then uses the word in this passage and he says that the spirit has been richly poured out. I like how Paul used the word poured out to describe our receiving of the Holy Spirit. See, when something is poured out, a substance that exists in one place, in one container is transferred to another. And when that is done, it is done for a distinct purpose. So for example, I can attest to this this morning. When we pour out freshly brewed coffee from a coffee pot, that is because we are groggy, lacking energy, and we are pouring out this thing that's gonna revive us and give us the energy we need to move forward into our day. See, when on a hot day, when your throat is dry and we pour out some cold water, that water is to quench our thirst and refresh and replenish our bodies so that we can keep moving and not faint, weary, under the heat and under dehydration. And when we pour out water into our plants, that's because we know it is in that pouring that these plants get what they need to sprout new life and to bring forth what's needed to keep our ecosystem and our earth functioning and growing. Church, there's power in the pouring out. And so with Jesus Christ, the same thing happens to us through Christ. Spiritually, spiritually, in obedience to God, Jesus came to earth wrapped in flesh, God wrapped in flesh. 
and he came with a distinct purpose. It was no one else on earth that could refill what we lacked. And so he came and he gave his life. He emptied down to the last. He emptied himself and he gave his life so that we don't succumb to the sin that was running rampant in us and running rampant on earth so that we don't endure eternal suffering. And then when he was returning to the father, he still didn't leave this earth empty. He returned and gave a promise that he would ask the father to send another helper, another advocate. And when he returned to the father, that promise was fulfilled when the spirit was poured out on believers on the day of Pentecost and the church was born and they began to evangelize and preach the gospel and reach people and places that the gospel had never reached before. That was in the pouring out of God's spirit on us. So church, when we feel stuck, when we feel stagnant, when we feel unmotivated, when we feel empty, or when we feel like we just can't move to where God is calling us to because we feel there's so much before us, I need us to remember two things this afternoon that should get us back on track real quick. The first is remember where God's grace has brought you from. Be motivated by where God has brought you from. Because Romans 3.23 tells me, for all has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It didn't say for all, but you, insert your name. It said for all has fallen short. So the fact that we fell short and God lifted us, please, motivation number one, to get unstuck unfilled and back to where God is calling us to. My second point would be that to remember that God's spirit is poured richly out on us when we accepted Jesus Christ in faith. So I like how the scripture says richly, the version I read said generously, those are the total opposites of stingily. It didn't say that God was stingy with what he poured out on us. It said it was rich and generous. Through the sacrifice of his son, he fulfilled the promise to pour his spirit out on us. So that brings me to today's title, poured out for a purpose, poured out for a purpose. Church, all that I've just said to you in going through leading up to now, this is our inspiration. This is our motivation. This is what causes us to beat back and kick down everything that the devil puts in our way and tries to keep us stagnant, stagnant, stuck, and us feeling like we don't have what it takes. This is the motivation that we need to carry into the world and to pull up others and to win souls for the kingdom. And this is the motivation we need to live lives in obedience to God when the devil would try to trick us to say, it's too hard to live the way God called us to. It's not. We have the motivation that we need. We should be inspired by God's pouring out through Jesus Christ and his spirit and, and all that we have experienced because of God's grace. Paul says that through Jesus Christ, we have the confidence that we need to inherit eternal life. We have the confidence. And then he puts a phrase at the end, this is a trustworthy saying. Paul says this five times in the, in the um, pastoral epistle. This is noted five times in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. This is a trustworthy statement because in my mind, Paul is saying, you better put that, you better put everything on this. 
And he is saying, I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. So we've seen how we've experienced God's grace in the pouring out of his spirit. But now that should motivate us towards a purpose. And Paul is saying, all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. Christ poured out his spirit on his church for a purpose. That we got to do something with it. That we got to show some devotion. And we got to show that we are so devoted to him and so grateful for what he's done to us that we are ready to devote ourselves to living a life pleasing to him and to do good towards others. We have God's spirit dwelling in us. And this is what will move us towards that devotion and to move us towards doing all that we've been called to do. So I wanna give a brief illustration of what I'm saying here. It might sound funny, but I think it has purpose. So people don't know this, but I have a favorite soda. If you wanna put a smile on my face, I have a favorite soda. It is a cherry vanilla Coke Zero. I don't see them often. I see the cherry vanilla Coke, they don't, not all people carry the Zero. So I love a cherry vanilla Coke Zero. Not just a regular Coke Zero, not just a cherry Coke Zero. It must be a cherry vanilla Coke Zero. So on Sunday after service, I went to Giant. And not only did Giant have 20 ounce bottles of cherry vanilla Coke Zero, but church, they were on sale. So I excitedly snatched up a six pack for myself. And I said, I guess I can't go empty handed. So I got um, a regular cherry vanilla Coke Zero for Scott as well. So as I brought them home, I was so excited to have them because I said, I'm going to have one with dinner. So when dinner came, I excitedly grabbed my glass and I filled it with ice because I like it cold. And as I was preparing to pour out my soda into my glass, here comes Maya. And Maya walks into the kitchen and without saying a word, she too goes and grabs a glass and she too hits the ice maker on the refrigerator and she came and stood right next to me with this glass unfilled. Having not exchanged no words, but kind of observing what was going on with my daughter, I realized that she wanted some of my soda. She wanted some of my prized cherry vanilla Coke Zero. But without hesitation, because I love her, I proceeded to pour some of my cherry vanilla Coke Zero into her cup that had the ice in it. And I saw the flavor go in and I saw the bubbles fizz up, that power that's contained in the soda. And then I let it settle a little bit. And I gave her a little bit more and it fizzed back up. And then I turned to my cup and I began to pour the remainder in my glass. But as I looked up, I realized that Maya hadn't moved. Instead of moving forward in acknowledgement and excitement of what I had just poured in her cup without even having to ask, beg or plead, she didn't move forward. She's not celebrating the greatness that's in her cup. Matter of fact, She's standing there holding that cup before me, looking for more in spite of what I've poured into that cup. She's standing there allowing the carbonation to settle. And she's standing there allowing that flavor to get diluted by ice because she won't move forward. Church, I looked at her in my frustration and I said, don't eat your dinner now. But before we shake our heads and judge Maya, 
I think it's time that we put ourselves under the microscope. See, because we too came before God empty, lacking, and having sin run and rule our lives. And God observed our motions. He observed our actions. And without nothing being said, God had a plan to fill our cups. And so God sent his beloved son to die on a cross on a good Friday, dying a criminal's death, an innocent man on our behalf. And God lifted him up out of that bottom tomb and he rose again and God ascended him back to heaven. But not to leave us alone, God poured out once again and he poured out his spirit richly on us when we accept his son, Jesus Christ. We see this and prophesied even before Jesus, where Joel 2.28 says that God says that I will pour out my spirit upon us all. And then, bear with me, church. And then he says to us again in the book of Isaiah 43, uh, 44, chapter three, for I will pour out water to quench your thirsty and I will irrigate your parched fields and I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your children. Church, this wasn't a last minute plan. This was prophesied way before. And so God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is the execution of God's word that was going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so church, it is because of God's grace and his mercy shown through Jesus Christ that we should not be standing around acting like we don't have enough. We should not be standing around acting like we are empty cups. We should not be standing around diluting this power that is held within us. We should not be standing around allowing that flavor, that salt to get run amok and pulled away by the schemes of the devil. Church, you got a flavor. You got a power. It has been poured richly into you and God's spirit has been poured into you not to stand around get moving there are souls out there who needs God there are souls out there who needs the flavor you bring there are souls out there who needs that power that bubbles up in you and they need to see it church I come before you very humbly to say get moving the same thing I told Maya, get out of here. We got to get moving, telling the good news, telling what God has done for us, telling how all week we had a weather report that said the rain was going to start at one and two, and that rain didn't break open until four o'clock when the picnic was open. Tell somebody how God changed the weather report for his people. Because it is that message that's going to bring others and win souls. Church, I'm going to tell you right now, i leave you with three points. Be prepared. Praying for God to use us and to show us how we can serve him. Everybody has a role. Everybody has a role. The second point, be in position. Stay within the fellowship church. Don't go astray. Show up on Sundays. Show up on Thursdays. If God inspires you to take a class, take that class. It is the information that will equip you to bring forth his word in confidence and in power submitting to him. And number three, be poised. You stand upright. You stand with your back arch and your back straight and ready to go because you have the confidence you have the assurance based on what has been poured out for us we who believe in him 
we have been, we need to live right in his sight. And then he's also given us the confidence that we need, we have eternal life. What more are we lacking? What more are we needing? We have his power within us. Be poised and walk out there upright and be an example of where Christ has brought you from. Church, I charge you this week, just as God's spirit has been richly poured out for us, start pouring out and into somebody else. Start pouring that power, that flavor, that flair, that passion, that inspiration that's within us into somebody else. I charge you this week to do that. Pour into them the same way Christ emptied himself and poured out his spirit for us. Church, I leave you today remembering God's spirit has been poured out for a purpose and we need to now move in that purpose. Thank you, church, and have a great day. Amen. 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 So.